Well, well, well. Look who came crawling back. It's, it's me. I came crawling back. So today's video is going to be a little different because I'm not going to go over how I make the actual thing that I'm making. And that's for two reasons. Main one being that I really want to focus on talking about how to make food safe items. And there's so much to say on this topic that if I also included the entire process of making the thing first, this video would be so long. The second reason is because I'll be using a CNC machine to make these things instead of doing it by hand. And I don't want to be one of those people that assumes that most small makers have a CNC machine just lying around at home. So if someone does end up wanting a tutorial for that specifically, I can do that separately. But in the meantime, if you're really dying to know how to make this by hand, I did go over the instructions in the very, very first video that I ever made. So feel free to go check that out. I'm going to also link it down below. But just a heads up, since it's the first video that I ever made, it's not really the best quality. So sorry about that. But I digress. Back to the point. So I want to talk about making things that are food safe. Now, finishes vary greatly, and which one you should use depends on what it is that you're making. And I mean that in terms of how good the final product will look, how long it will last, and how it may impact your health. To give two extreme examples, finishes that come into contact with food, for example, are super safe because they're not harmful when ingested. Because that's their point, right? But you don't want to use those on things that you plan on keeping outside, because those finishes aren't heavy duty enough to protect against the elements. On the other end of that spectrum, finishes that are able to protect furniture and porches and things that are meant to be outside, they're a lot more robust, but they tend to emit VOCs while drying. So you want to make sure to apply them in heavily ventilated areas, preferably outside, because they will emit fumes while drying that are actually really gnarly for your health. And then also, you don't want chunks of those finishes ending up in your food because you really shouldn't be ingesting them. So these two finishes are not interchangeable, and you want to know what you need to use for what it is that you're making. I'll be showing the finishes on baby rattles. The reason I decided to use baby toys is because these are the items that I'm most paranoid with. I give these to my friend's children, and I know that whatever finish I put on them will end up in their mouths. So it has to be completely safe, and it has to seal the wood really well, because we can't have any mold or bacterial growth on the inside of the toy once it is exposed to moisture. And then my logic is, if it passes the baby rattle test and it's safe for that, then it passes the cutting board and general food test for everything else. But before we get into the finishes, I want to quickly talk about the wood a little bit. Because if you don't use the right kind of wood, there is no finish in the world that will save you. The first rule is that you want to use hardwoods for these types of projects, rather than a soft wood or a wood that is porous. Soft and porous wood is way more prone to bacterial growth, because it has pockets where things can get in and grow. So even though it's cheap and easy to find, Stay away from woods like poplar. It's a soft wood and it can easily be damaged and bent and broken, and it's at a very high risk for bacterial growth. Hickory might sound like a good candidate because it is a hardwood, but unfortunately it is a hardwood that is very porous. So it's great for furniture making because it will be sturdy, but it's generally not recommended for things that come into contact with food. Now, oak would be a great one because it's a hardwood and not very porous. But I wanted to use this example when I saw it at the store because it's kind of counterintuitive. Red oak isn't a great candidate because the chemical in it that makes it red, which is called tannic acid, is mildly toxic and it has a really bitter taste they can sometimes get on the food and toys. So while white oak would be great, red oak would not. Maple is great, and it's actually the go-to when it comes to cutting boards and other kitchen things, but the problem is it's a bit on the pricey side. 
So if you want to make something but you're just starting out and you don't want to waste expensive material while you practice and potentially just create waste, it may not be the best option. For this project, I went with Elder. It hits all the criteria that I needed to pass, and it's on the more affordable side from White Oak and Maple. So if you find that, I think it's a pretty good candidate. I also want to make a note here because for anyone that frequents my channel, you probably know that I'm a big fan of repurposing scraps. But not for this. Or more specifically, if you do use scraps, make sure that you know where they came from and that they are from a larger piece that you bought, not found. This is because if you don't know where the original wood came from, you don't know if it was treated with insecticides in order to prevent infestation while sitting in a warehouse. And then you risk introducing those things into your food or to a child. So if you don't know where the scraps came from, just save them for a different project. Okay, now on to the main part. The finishes. So the finishes that I'm going to go through are butcher block oil and tongue oil, which are two that I'm very familiar with because I've used them before. And then also I'm going to use the real milk paint, which I have never used before. So this is going to be kind of like a review where I try it out. And this is technically not a finish because that one will most likely need another finish on top of it in order to seal everything in. But for the sake of this video, I will review it as though it's its own finish. And then also, I use Tight Bond 3 wood glue because this one is waterproof and approved for indirect use around food. And as always, I am not sponsored or affiliated or whatever secret shady words influencers use in order to hide that they're being paid to promote things. My shopmates and I bought all of these ourselves, so if I paid for something and it sucks, it is my right to say that it sucks. I'm going to start off with the milk paint, because that's what I'm the most excited about. I'll put the link in my description, but what I got from them is this large bag of one of their Oops colors, which is a shade that they mixed incorrectly, so they sold it at a discount. And then I also got a bunch of samples. That way I can make the rattle nice and bright. Unlike most other paints, milk paint comes in a powder, and all you have to do is mix it with equal parts water and it's ready to go. Now, milk paint itself is nothing new. These types of colors have been around for a while, and they're well known for being super safe. They're literally made from powdered milk protein, lime, clay, and then pigments. And in case you're wondering, no, it will not spoil or start to smell once you paint something with it. But once you mix it, you can't just leave the mixture out because if it doesn't get a chance to dry, it will spoil. So if you do have to keep it for a few days after you mix it, make sure to store it in the fridge. I, I'm not going to lie here. I had a bit of trouble with this. I used these little red cups and I filled them up to the same line, one with water, one with powder. That way I know that it's exactly one to one. But even though I stirred it for like 10 minutes, I didn't get a super smooth texture. It looked very grainy and bubbly. I figured it may be because I was mixing such a small amount for the radley bits, but then I had the same issue when I tried to mix the blue, for which I used a much higher quantity. The paint felt very thick, even though I tried to apply pretty conservative layers, and it looked like it was going to leave a texture. I was really curious how this would work for toys and cutting boards and such, because from what I've seen from other people's channels, Milk paint is generally used for furniture because if you layer it, it gives this really nice weathered crackling effect. And now that I see it drying, I get why it works really well for that. But it makes me think that it will never give a nice smooth finish and will always feel gritty, which is a problem when it comes to things that will be handled a lot. Like, for example, children's toys. But I decided to let it dry and see what happens. Now, to be fair to the company, they do have an instructional video on YouTube where they explain that it's best to put the paint mixture in a jar and then throw in a marble and then shake the whole thing to mix it really, really well. But to be fair to me, they also have multiple videos where they show that you should also be able to just stir it and then use it without a problem. If this doesn't dry how I wanted to, I'll circle back and retry my mixing approach. I want to be fair. 
While that dries, I'll move on to tongue oil. Now, tongue oil is not to be confused with tongue oil finish. They sound similar, but they're actually different. Tongue oil comes from the tongue tree, so it's just the pure oil. And it's one of the main go-tos when it comes to food safe finishes. It's really good because unlike other oils, it actually does dry to form a hard surface on top of the wood, unlike butcher block oil, which just absorbs but never actually hardens. The drawback to tongue oil is that it's kind of hard to work with. It's pretty viscous and takes about three days to fully dry. This is one of the reasons why it's so hard to find in hardware stores, at least in my experience. This is where the tongue oil finish comes in. The finish is also made with tongue oil, but it's cut with minerals or poly or something else in order to make it easier to work with. But now the drawback is that those additives make it less food safe. This is why I want to make the distinction. My recommendation here is for a regular tongue oil, not the tongue oil finish. Lucky for me, the real milk paint site also had tongue oil, and they also had a solvent for it. The solvent is made out of citrus, so mixing it in doesn't affect the safety of the overall mixture. All the solvent does is it makes it less viscous and it lets it dry faster, but it evaporates once it's dried. So the solvent is not actually found in the final product, which is great because what you're left with is just that tongue oil in the end. The recommended proportions for this are one to one, but as long as you don't put more solvent than tongue oil, you can adjust that until you get the consistency that you like. I used a little bit less solvent just because I wanted a slightly thicker mixture. I felt like that was a little easier to work with than something that was way too liquidy. I then applied it and let that bad boy dry. In the end, I ended up putting about three layers of tongue oil, which is what I expected I would need. And while that was drying, I went back to the milk paint. As I suspected, it felt very thick and chalky, and after I touched it, even though none of the paint transferred, it still left my fingers feeling gritty. So I decided to experiment a bit. I sanded off the excess, and then I added a bit more water to the paint mixture, and then I applied it on like a stain. So I added on a very thin layer, and then I wiped it off. This did give a very nice shade of blue, and it looked way smoother, but it still felt a little bit like chalk. So, I decided to try it one more time. Luckily, I made a few extra rattles, so I had one to spare. I mixed two colors for this one, just because I wanted to make it a little more interesting, and then I added my powder and water into the jar. And since I didn't have a marble, I got creative and made do with things that I had around the shop. And then I shook the hell out of it. I'm serious. I did this for like 10 minutes. But in the end, it ended up being worth it because the final mixture was way smoother than the previous one. So I guess the lesson here is, when it comes to milk paint, it needs to be... Shaken, not stirred. And then I painted again. And even though the mixture was much smoother, it still looked too thick. I let it dry and sure enough it was streaky and I could see it cracking in some spots. So not promising. But I wanted to see if a coat of tongue oil can save it. I let it dry while I moved on to the last one, the butcher block oil. Now this one is super common for cutting boards. It's safe, pretty easy to find, and it's made to come into contact with food. The downside is that it doesn't really dry at least not in a sense that finishes like poly dry. So you have to really saturate the piece in the oil, but no matter how good of a job you do, after some use, the oil will come off and you will have to either reapply or you risk the wood eventually ending up dry and cracking and warping and you would just have to throw the entire piece out. So I love this and I use it for my own cutting boards, but if I'm going to make something that I plan on gifting, I know that I can't expect the other person to put in the effort and do the upkeep. I don't think people are generally prepared to do this, especially when it comes to baby toys that are constantly getting cleaned. This will make the oil come off way faster, and I don't know too many parents that have the time to go back and resaturate the kids' toys. 
So that's the drawback of butcher block oil. While everything was drying, the final step was to apply the tongue oil to the two milk paint rattles. I wanted to see if it would be able to seal the paint in and not make it feel as grainy, or if it would start dissolving the paint and make it look patchy. And now that everything is dry, here are my final results. The butcher block oil looks great. It's fully saturated, but like I said before, because this oil doesn't really harden, it won't fix any imperfections that the wood has. This is especially visible around the end grain, which is a lot harder to smooth out as well as the rest of it. So here you can see a bit of roughness. Comparing the tongue oil to that, it looks similar to butcher block oil, but feels so much smoother to the touch. And when you put them side by side, you can even see around the end grain that the tongue oil has a smoothness that the other one just doesn't have. So I'm really loving the tongue oil. This is hands down my favorite one and my new go-to. And the real milk paint brand that I use today exceeded my expectations. Then finally, we have the milk paint paint. I don't want to say that I don't like it. I actually really do. But I don't like it for toys and I don't think I would ever use it for a cutting board or anything else that I use for food. The purple one is cracking and you can see that the tongue oil started to dissolve it a bit, so you can see right through the paint. And the blue one, the colors got really muted with the tongue oil and it still didn't fix the issue that I have with the grittiness. I can still kind of feel it under my fingers. So I definitely see how this would look really good on furniture and how it would create this really cool effect. But for me, the huge sell of this paint was that it's safe to be used around food. And I don't particularly care about my furniture being food safe, so I don't know. I'm really curious if anybody watching this has used the real milk paint or milk paint in general and had different results. And if you have, could you let me know how it went for you? I'm legitimately curious if I'm using this wrong or this is maybe not the right application for it. But I'm going to end the video right here. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for being patient because I know it took me a while to get this out. And I hope to see you next time. Bye.